Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the John P. Berkelin lecture entitled The Power of the Reich in the German Imagination. And the lecture this evening will be delivered by John Connolly, who is the Sidney Hellman Ehrman Professor of European History at the University of California at Berkeley and is a fellow here at the Academy this semester. So we have essentially two different formats that we deploy, one in which I get to do an elaborate introduction of the speaker, and the other in which I'm kind of an uh, intellectual footman and get to introduce the introducer, which is a, um, a regrettable thing from my perspective because mm -hmm. Uh, John Connolly is a friend of 30 years, yes, yeah, th thank you, um, 30 plus, he said, and um, not something I admit to readily, but uh, we met in Berlin uh, in those heady days of the early 90s, and uh, I have admired uh, John ever since. We have, uh, we did a Zoom event um, not too long ago with John, and I have, uh, really been a great uh, great fan of his output, and I've always thought among my few friends who qualified as genuine intellectuals that John was um, high up on the list, and to prove that, I'm going to hold up his book <laughs> to the side, because it's a really big book, and it's a fabulous piece of work from Peoples into Nations, a history of Eastern Europe, and we had a great book talk with John. Uh, back in the bad old days of the pandemic, um, which made it easier to not fly people in from Berkeley. But um, anyway, so uh, I am going to leave the actual introduction uh, to the introducer, who I will introduce shortly. But um, <clears throat> for now, let me just say about the uh, person for whom this lecture is named. John Berkland, um was a remarkable uh, American who was passionately dedicated to the humanities, and he was a great supporter of the Academy's work. Um, born in Chicago, he graduated from Princeton. He served as a naval intelligence officer here in Berlin before returning to the U.S. and building a long and very successful career in the business world. Uh, he was the longtime CEO of a firm named Dylan Reed, which has been absorbed by other firms. Uh, but he was a very, very distinguished businessman, and he served on many different boards, including that of Brown University, where he was a trustee. Um, unusually for someone with that profile, he was also an accomplished historian uh, who was very interested in the interplay of education, history, policy, and culture. And he wrote a biography of Gustav Stresemann, who was chancellor and foreign minister during the Weimar Republic. Uh, in 1990, uh, John Berkland was appointed by President George H.W. Bush to organize and chair the Polish-American Enterprise Fund, which was uh, set up to, stab to support reconstruction in Poland after the fall of the wall, and that fund was the most successful of all the different enterprise funds that were created. Um, he really was a rare combination of uh, business leader and intellectual, and I think his legacy uh, will live on um, long after his passing in 2019. So it's in this uh, spirit that uh, this semester's Berkeley fellow, John Connolly, is here. And I consider uh, John to be one of the best historians I know and certainly one of the most accomplished in the field of Central and Eastern European history. And if John has the time, he can tell us what the difference is between those. Um, <laughs> Anyway, you'll hear more about John from his formal and, um, and uh, designated introducer, Jan Klaus Behrens, uh, who's right here up front. Uh, Jan is professor of Eastern European history uh, at the uh, Europa, Europa uh, Universität Viadrina. He's also a senior researcher at the Leibniz Center uh, for contemporary history in Potsdam. He is well known for his research on Stalinism, propaganda, public discourse, violence, and wars in the Soviet and post-Soviet space. And maybe you'll come back and do another lecture because those sound really relevant. Um, he is a leading expert on the history of Soviet and Russian security services. Um, Professor Barron studied history, philosophy, and literature 
at the Freie Universität Berlin, the Humboldt, uh, the University of Wisconsin, Moscow State University, and he has his doctorate from uh, the University of Potsdam. Um, so he's been around a bit. Uh, Professor Barron, since, 19, since 2011, has been, as I said, working at the Leibniz Center, uh, where he currently coordinates uh, the Interdisciplinary Research Network Legacies of Communism with partners in six countries uh, that study authoritarian developments in Central and Eastern European states and the post-Soviet uh, world. He has extensively covered the, Ru the Russo-Ukrainian War and political uh, developments, excuse me, in Russia under Putin. Uh, and he writes uh, a lot for the German press. You can also hear him every two weeks in the podcast uh, Ostrus de Salon Kolumisten. And I have learned that people who do podcasts always think that's the most important thing in their biography. Is that true, sir? Um, and I recommend that you follow him on Twitter, as I do. Um, in case you're not doing so already. So just before I hand it over to Professor Behrens, uh, give you a little roadmap. Uh, uh, John Connolly's talk will last for about 40 minutes. It will be followed by a Q&A um, moderated by uh, Professor Behrens. If you're here with us in the, in the academy, I think you know what to do when you want to ans ask a question. If you're joining by Zoom, uh, <clears throat> Don't raise your hand at home. It won't do any good. Uh, please type your question into the Q&A part of the Zoom platform. Uh, Jan, I am envious that you get to do this, in, this uh, introduction. Well, thank you very much for the um, introduction of the introducer, I guess. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and pleasure to be here at the American Academy tonight and to be chosen to introduce my dear friend, uh, John Connolly. John is, as was already mentioned, the Sidney Hellman Airman Professor of European History at the University of California at Berkeley. And he holds a BA in International Relations from Georgetown and MAs from both Michigan and Harvard, where he also received his PhD in history in 1994. Um, after that, he joined the UC Berkeley History Department, where he has taught since, and that's how we know him, right? I have known him and admired John's research uh, since the 1990s, so we also go uh, quite a way back. We both, I think, we can say, um, belong to a generation of historians who went out to explore the archives of the post-communist party states after their downfall. And in a way, maybe there was an easier time uh, uh, because um, you know, we, could, we could be all excited about opening up these, these files for the first time and, uh, and um, uh, contributing to the study of dictatorships. Um, uh, while today, if people work, my students work on the post-Soviet times, it's much more confusing where their sources are. They don't just have these, these uh, nice and neat party archives that we could go to. In his dissertation, uh, John analyzed the Sovietization of higher education in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany after 1945, resulting in his book, Captive University. Um, and in this book, and that's why it impressed me, he pointed to the differences, actually, between the three different cases he studied. Uh, because, as John argued, even under the iron-fisted Stalinist rule, uh, where you know, ideological conformity was imposed from above, you could see the differences between the Polish, the German, and the Czechoslovak tradition. Um, and I believe that this close scrutiny, this close observation of diversity in Central and Eastern Europe is key to understanding uh, John's historical research and his works to this day. It works to John's advantage that he has profound knowledge of the entire region and its languages. And not everybody does, right? Um, it's uh, quite a pain to, to learn uh, Slavic languages sometimes if you're not a native uh, speaker. Anybody who's tried that knows that. Um, and he has always been, therefore, much more than just a historian of Central Europe. He works on Central and Eastern Europe. 
And I think when he talks about German history, that his fascination with the east of the continent um, has allowed him for new perspectives, actually, on German history. Uh, because, you know, he doesn't just look at Germany, but he looks sort of like um, from different perspectives on the center of the, of the continent, I would argue. In his most recent book, uh, that's the big uh, stone that was uh, shown uh, uh, recently here, um, from People's Intonations, published in 2020 with Princeton University Press, he has meticulously outlined the different varieties of nationalism and nation building in Eastern Europe, and I would say convincingly argued that these nations may not just be understood simply as, you know, what was the fashionable way, of course, when, when I was a graduate student, as imagined communities or invention of tradition, but rather Following the example of Miroslav Hoch, John has outlined the complex relationship between national movements, language, the emergence, emergence excuse me, of both socialism and capitalism, and the conflict between nation and empire in the region. Um, a conflict, if I may add, that is, in my opinion, the underlying reason for the current war of Russia against Ukraine, um, Russia being the imperial power and uh, Ukraine the nation state. So we can see that this conflict um, between nation and empire is not just historical, but is actually something very contemporary and, uh, and tragic, I should say, to this day. <coughs> Thus, I would argue that throughout his work, uh, John has constantly focused on the conflicts in the regions, on the struggle between nation and empire, and if I'm not mistaken, his plan is now to tackle these sort of questions for German history. Uh, in his new book, or in his new project, as people say, John will explore the meaning and the after effects of the sometimes, I would argue, somewhat enigmatic concept of the Reich, the kingdom or empire, for the history of the German lands. His work will, of course, be a historical study, and we all know that the German Reich ended in unconditional surrender in May 1945. But is it really over? And isn't there maybe a, a story to tell that, again, like the conflict between nation and empire, you know, um, goes on until our, our present uh, day? I give you just one uh, example. If you follow the German news, just last week, German federal police conducted a large raid against the so-called Reichsbürger, or roughly translated, citizens of the Reich, I guess. Uh, a right-wing political movement which claims that the German Reich actually never ended, um, and that the Federal Republic is nothing more than a corporation uh, which uh, you know, sits on top of the never-ending uh, thousand-year Reich uh, here. Well, whatever. Um, well, this is clearly a movement of the lunatic fringe, uh, I believe that the idea of the Reich in German history certainly demands uh, further scrutiny, and I'm looking forward to what uh, John has to say about the imagined or maybe sometimes somewhat real concept uh, of the Reich. So please follow my invitation for a deep dive into German history. And John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I will have nothing to say about the Reichsbürger. Um, yes. Um, so, you know, um, some of you have been to these events before. You know that speakers often discuss work they've been involved with for years, but um, my case is a bit different. I've been thinking about the issues I'm going to talk about for a long time, but I'm just uh, getting to work on research thanks to this marvelous sabbatical at the American Academy. So before I say anything else, I just want to state my eternal gratitude uh, to the Academy, its president, its glorious staff, truly glorious staff, um, too numerous to be mentioned by name, but they all deserve to be named. Um, yes, indeed. Um, and then my brilliant, fascinating, and generous uh, fellows, fellow fellows, um, for what is already uh, proving to be a high point of my life, and I mean that not only in academic terms. So, um, so my project, as you've heard, deals with Germany, 
uh, but Germany in an unusual sense. I'm interested in the relation of the deep past to the present. Are there things that come from the depths of history from hundreds of years ago that continue to shape our lives today, constraining what we do and think in ways that we are hardly aware? Or does so much happen, for example, even after a cataclysmic event like the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, in the form of new institutions, new states, a multitude of new habits, that after 400 years, this shattering event in which 40% of the inhabitants of Central Europe, Central Europe lost their lives, that this event can be said not to matter at all, that it's completely buried. Does it matter to today's inhabitants of Berlin, for example, that the population of this city went in the 1620s from 127,000 to 6,000 in 1848? So are these things irrelevant, buried, and gone for good? It's my general curiosity. So to get to my specific topic, um, you know that Adolf Hitler called his Germany a Third Reich, meaning a Third Empire. Um, That usage was very unusual, the way that he meant it, which is an empire within Europe. In the 19th century, Napoleon and his nephew, Louis Napoleon, called France an empire within Europe. But their empires were brief episodes, if you'll recall, limited to a few decades. What Hitler was referring to was a Reich that was supposed to last a thousand years. But there was another Reich that stretched a thousand years in the opposite direction. That was the so-called First Empire, founded by Charlemagne, supposedly in 800, and then snuffed out by Napoleon Bonaparte in, in 1806, the Holy Roman Empire. That empire was unusual because it was not Roman, but was mostly German, though not entirely. In the early centuries, for instance, it contained huge tracts of land in Italy, and all of Burgundy in what is now France, and much, much more. But then, after much of the empire's Italian and French lands were lost in the late 1400s, the empire was occasionally called not just the Holy Roman Empire, but the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. What could that possibly mean? Was it Germany or was it not Germany? Why did it include much of Italy and France all of Czechia, today's Czechia, and Luxembourg if it was Germany? What was a nation in 1500 before there were nation states, and why exactly was it an empire? This is 1648. The previous slide was a bit earlier than that. Okay. So this is very deep past, seemingly anecdotal, irrelevant. I know that this is a blank slide. I've learned from Lauren, actually, that that's a good idea to put up blank slides occasionally. Um, Now, when Europeans advanced into the modern age after the French Revolution, creating republics and constitutional monarchies with modern parties and elections. That ancient time, very old time, of the unquestioned right to rule of Europe's emperors and kings and princes was arguably over, cut off behind a rupture in time to which there was supposedly no return. In England and France, this fact was symbolized by the execution of kings. A Charles in 1649, and a Louis in 1793. Other kings followed after the democratic revolutions in these places, but they no longer possess the same claims to untrammeled power. As you know, British kings uh, are supposed to, ex- uh, are, are, are expected to share power with representatives of the people, and that power has been diminishing over time. So now uh, let us fast forward to the year 1848. That's not that long ago. My grandfather was born in 1884. I knew him quite well. And he would have known plenty of people who had a distinct memory of 1848. His grandfather, for instance, who had fled Germany and a few years later set up a store on Pine Street in Philadelphia called Fleischmann's Fancy Furs. (laughs) He was a Kirschnermeister from the city of Weissenburg in Bayern. The year 1848 started as a year of would-be democratic revolutions, putting monarchs to flight from Paris to Naples, an extraordinary story, and then north to Milan and Berlin and east to Bucharest. So why on earth in the German lands, today's focus, did the 1848 rebels, men and women who risked their lives for freedom, for democratic rights, claim The new democratic Germany they wanted to make was not a republic but an empire, a Deutsches Reich, 
This is from the center of the Deutsches Reich, by the way, from the city of Prague. What did they mean? Doesn't an empire need an emperor, a kind of king? What were these Democrats thinking? Just to recall, at that particular point, 1848, there was no German nation state, but rather a collection of German mini-states like Bavaria or Hanover, loosely gathered into something called the German Confederation or the Deutsche Bund. I'll show you briefly another slide. Uh, maybe we'll leave that for a little bit longer. This is the Deutsche Bund. Um, this is what the powers that had defeated Napoleon agreed in 1815 would take the place of the Holy Roman Empire. So what did the German revolutionaries of 1848 have in mind when they set out to make a democracy that would be known as an empire? Was it what we consider an empire, a place with a center, a metropole that rules over other peoples in vast stretches of territory, like Britain or Spain or Portugal across many oceans? The answer is no. For Germans, empire simply meant what we would call a nation state, a German nation state, a state for the Germans that was German and entirely in Europe, which for some reason they insisted upon calling an empire. As you may know, and as my great-great-grandfather experienced, the revolutions of 1848 failed, Democrats were subdued by armies, kings and princes returned to power, and it was not until 1871 that Germany became a nation state under Otto von Bismarck. This was the so-called Second Reich. It had an emperor, indeed, the king of Prussia, but unfortunately, this Germany was not exactly a democracy. That is, there were elections, but the representatives who were elected to parliament did not ultimately rule the country. The person who did rule the country ultimately was the emperor, or a Kaiser. Thus, it's called the Kaiserreich. You'll know the names, William I, William II. When the latter abdicated in November 1918 after a catastrophically failed war, revolution broke out again in Central Europe and elections were held the next year. As in 1848, the challenge was to break from the past and create a democratic future. Thus, Germany's parliamentarians took refuge to the quiet central German city of Weimar and drew up a constitution. When they were finished, although there were no longer kings or princes in Germany, and although the Kaiser had abdicated and fled to the Netherlands, you will never guess what Germany's Democrats call the new state, which we call the Weimar Republic. Yes, they called it an empire. If you don't believe that, look at your old stamp collection or look at a stamp that I found a representation of. This is from the 1920s, a uh, good social democrat, Friedrich Ebert, who was featured on a stamp bearing the words Deutsches Reich, Weimar Republic. Now, why does such terminology matter? What does it matter what Germans call their nation state? One reason, and I'm going to go into academic um, shop talk for a little bit right now, uh, one reason for caring is that where the German state fit into European history and whether it was like the states that surround it or very different from those states is the most controversial question that has engaged historians of Germany in the last half century. I'm referring to the so-called Zonderweg debate. And by the way, that word is featured on your glossary along with other helpful words. Um, so this debate um, was about whether Germany had a separate path to modernity different from that of other European states. The debate was a huge deal when I entered graduate school, although I think it's safe to say it's pretty much petered out by now. In distant retrospect, it seems to me the debate was actually not conducted in a very productive way. The issue in this controversy about whether Germany was somehow special or just another European state was how we think about democratic revolution. The breakthrough from a world of monarchs to a world of states governed by national self-determination, the thing that revolutionaries of 1848 hoped to achieve. When academics debated this question in the 1970s and 1980s, even non-Marxist historians thought much more in Marxist and avowedly liberal categories than we do today. Historians of those years, 40 and 50 years ago, imagined history moving in a progression of each phase of history fitting a story of progress toward greater human emancipation, from feudalism and monarchy through capitalism and liberal democracy, perhaps one day leading to socialism, a general hope. Thus, the Zonderweg debate was debated and kind of settled in Marxist and quasi-Marxist terms. One side argued that Germany did not have a proper bourgeois revolution, 
a very Marxian category, and thus had diverged from a normal Western course of development. Its bourgeoisie had failed to seize power from princes and kings in 1848, failed its historic task, and, and, and yielded the formation of the German state to the feudal authoritarianism of Bismarck and ultimately the reactionary Nazism of Hitler. The other side in this debate, in a sense the better Marxists, argued that if you looked at Bismarck's Germany, actually the middle classes, that is the bourgeoisie, had established control over things that were important to them, like protection of property, freedom of scholarship and commerce, flourishing high culture. Moreover, Germany may not have been perfectly democratic under Bismarck and his successors, but it was advancing toward democracy with a range of political parties and very clean elections. Then in 1914, the Kaiser fouled things up by getting Germany involved in something called World War I and a defeat so devastating that the country slipped off to radicalism in the inter interwar years like much of Europe. So this side had a point. By the 1930s, democracy had failed, not just in Germany, but virtually everywhere east of the Rhine River, um, excluding Czechoslovakia. Thus, Germany had not gone a separate way, according to this argument, but the way of most European countries. So as an East Europeanist, I've been identified and outed as an East Europeanist, um, I know about the challenges to democracy in Poland or Romania or Hungary in the 1920s. But still, there's something special and different about Germany. It, as German President Frank-Walter Steinmeier said a few years ago, affected a unique break with civilization. Steinmeier was thinking of the world war and the genocides the German state launched after 1939. So the Historians Guild, the Zunft, may have agreed that Germany's way was not so special, but the educated pu public, and I suspect many of you in these seats, feels that indeed something was unusual about Germany's path. Steinmeier, by the way, uttered this formula in response to a right radical named Gauland, who said that the 12 years of Hitler meant nothing on the background, the background of big German history. They were nothing more than, he said, Vogelschiss. It's on your, your glossary. I should note that a further weakness of that old debate beyond being stuck in Marxist, outdated Marxist categories is that it claimed to resolve the question of where Germany stood among European countries without actually comparing Germany to other European countries. So what stands out to me in comparative perspective is this question of empire. Only Germany has this heritage of making a land empire in European space. What about Russia? I hear Paul say. <laughs> so besides extending deep into Asia, Russia was different in one important way. Unlike Germany, Russia did not have the ambition of making everyone in its vast territory into Russians, Russians in the ethnic sense. So in that fact brings to a head what I consider to be the German peculiarity. Not only of making a huge land empire right in the middle of Europe, but making the boundaries of the nation state coincide with the boundaries of the empire. And therefore, everybody who happened to be in those boundaries, no matter what language they spoke, into Germans in an ethnic sense. This is very strange, an empire where the entire population was meant to consist of one ethnic nation. Now to a further peculiarity. I just used the word boundaries. A nation state has to have clear boundaries. But is not the fate of an empire not to have clear boundaries? In a sense, Germany, the Old Reich, indeed fit this expectation. For about a millennium, Germany, whatever it was, try to fit within an empire, at times to be an empire, but over all that time, Germany was rarely a stable entity. In fact, Germany is the one major European state whose basic shape, whose existence was determined within our own lifetimes. When I began graduate school, there was no Germany. There was the FRG, there was the GDR. But if you look to the early 1940s, Germany included all of today's Czech Republic as well as parts of Slovenia, France, and Poland. But if you look to the map before 1871, Germany again disappears as a state. But then if you go further back to before 1806, it was the entity mentioned earlier, the Holy Roman Empire, supposedly of the German nation, but which included all Czechs and Luxembourgers, lots of Danes and Italians, but at the same time left out millions of Germans, for example, those in East and West Prussia. The history of Germany is thus one of constant shape-shifting, 
Most of the rest of Europe, by contrast, had a different path. Look back to the year 1250, and you already find some form of England, France, Spain, Denmark, Norway, Hungary, Sweden, Ireland, Portugal, Poland, Serbia, Croatia, and Muscovy. The borders of these entities have changed, often radically, but the cores have been relatively stable. But in that year, there was no Germany of any kind and certainly no German state. Now, was this German peculiarity a problem? Why is it worth paying attention to, beyond the fact that we're interested in German history? The answer is that it was not a problem in general for all humanity, but it was a specific problem for the Germans. Without a state, there is no basic security, and I'll give you three episodes to make the point. Egregious examples of a problem that persisted for centuries and that is on your glossary, uh, what I call, and what was called, Fremdbestimmung, controlled by a foreigner. So one episode I have already uh, alluded to, the Thirty Years' War. From 1618 to 1648, foreign troops ran across occupied and devastated German territory. These troops came from all over Europe, lots of mercenaries, killing and maiming Germans, and leaving traces in the German language. There is a word, Magdeburgisieren, um, which has come to mean complete destruction of a city. You may have noticed, uh, those of us who were at the center in Wannsee, there are trains headed to a place called Magdeburg. What you may not know is that in 1631, mostly Catholic imperial troops subdued uh, mostly Protestant forces holding the city of Magdeburg after a siege and killed in cold blood some 20,000 non-combatants and then torched the city. Um, Magdeburg is here in his complete destruction. Second episode uh, involves Louis XIV, the Sun King. So if you like Heidelberg, as I do, I studied there, you would have liked it more before 1689, <laughs> before the wanton destruction of it and the Falz region by French troops. Here is the single house in Heidelberg that remains standing after 1689. It's the Hotel zum Ritter. You can see it in the background of this, of this painting from the time. It's, what, it's, 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 it's a house engulfed in flames. Um, another... Uh, uh, image from the time indicating uh, the attitude of Louis XIV toward Heidelberg and the entire Falz region. The third episode is the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. From 1792, French armies began occupying and pillaging and controlling German space for over 20 years, forcibly recruiting troops for French campaigns. So this is another fact you may not have known that of the Napoleon's Grand Army 420,000 soldiers when it began. Fully 120,000 of those students were Germans. Uh, students. Did I say students? <laughs> Too much time with them. May have been students as well. Um, soldiers uh, were forcibly conscripted from Napoleon's um, forced uh, um, allied states uh, in central Germany. And here's one of them saying goodbye to his wife. So, Fremdbestimmung, control of one's destiny by a foreigner, describes this intolerable situation. This is where I come back to how history matters. We may have forgotten, that is, we in the West are never known about these events. I'm guessing for a lot of you, these are, this is new news. But Germans of the 19th and even 20th century knew about these things. More accurately, they felt them as an enduring national trauma, buried somewhere, but still present and, and influential, where the fate of a country and the fate of individuals overlapped in ways that Americans can scarcely comprehend. So after centuries of incursions by neighbors, there was a special incentive among Germans to make a nation state after the empire was dissolved by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1806, of seeking basic security from having their fate dictated by outsiders. Either we create a state or we risk being slaves to other peoples. And the language, this is the language of nationalism, was actually a rather inflated language. One of the words that was used to describe this situation of being in Fremdbestimmung was Knechtschaft. It's also on your glossary, meaning something like slavery or servitude. Um, and as uh, you can see the swastika in the background, this is much later, this was a demand, a word used most handily by, most effectively by Germany's National Socialists. This is a poster from 1938 uh, related to the so-called so liberation of Austria and the Sudetenland. I'm not sure that this kind of elemental fear stood behind the nation-making efforts of any other great European nation. The question is, where does one begin the story of efforts to create 
this ideal of an impregnable Germany that would protect Germans from these kinds of things. One of the most famous answers is, and this, is, um, and this refers to a year I've mentioned several times, uh, is 1806. Thomas Nipperdai, historian of Munich, begins his fabulous history of Germany with the sentence, in the beginning was Napoleon. Am Anfang war Napoleon. There's an elegance to that, that answer, because Napoleon, at the height of Fremdbestimmung, that is, of the French occupation of Germany, simply declared the Holy Roman Empire null and void, and thus made it impossible for Germans to ignore the fact that as of 1806 they had no state whatsoever. This seemed a historic injustice, not only because German lands were open to predation, but because France had something that Germans felt they deserved, a state that would embody the nation and protect it. But now that the empire was gone, which for all its weakness was Germany's only political form, the question arose, what exactly was Germany? Early 19th century, where was it? The French question that arose at the transition to modernity after 1789 had been comparatively simple. Who was the French nation? It was the French people, the people who had been subjects of the French king on the territory of the French kingdom. Yet as of 1806, there was no German king and now no German state, and so the answer migrated from politics to ethnicity. Germans, the German intellectual class agreed, may have had no state, but they had something that was far more valuable. They had their own culture. So Germany was conceived of as a place of common culture, above all, of language. Germany was wherever the German language was heard, and the people speaking that language were the German Volk, also on your glossary. Um, this is the first appearance, to my knowledge, by the way, of the history, in history, of the ethnic nation as an ideology, early 19th century in Germany. So especially after 1806, we are getting to the sense of a very special kind of problem in making Germany. Germany had to be at least an empire, even for Democrats, right, as I've said. Um, that is how Germans read their history. So that would involve including millions of non-Germans in a future German state, Czechs, Italians, Poles, Luxembourgers, etc. However, the old empire, huge as it was, was not great enough to include all German speakers, right, this idea of Volk. Millions more lived outside the old empire's boundaries to the east. So this was a state, by its very conception, um, that would have the task of making millions of non-Germans into Germans. What if they objected? Perhaps more strikingly, it was going to be a state far larger than any other, upsetting any balance of power that existed or was ever created in Europe. This, I think, helps connect us to the beginnings of an answer, um, only the beginnings of an answer, to the challenge raised by President Steinmeier. Not what, make the, what made the unique break with civilization in the 1930s, as he put it, necessary or inevitable, but possible and thinkable, conceivable by human beings. To make the old idea of Reich and the modern idea of nation-state coincide gives hints as to the explosive energies that, have, that, that dwelt within the German question. It's no coincidence that Bismarck's Reich of 1871 first took violence outward to be created, three wars, one against Denmark in 1864, another against Austria in 1866, and the final one against France in 1870, all required simply that Germany could, could appear on the map. And, this, and, and second, that state, when created, engaged in violence, inward, toward its own citizens. Among, among the things Bismarck did in order to secure his, what I would call, pseudo-democratic empire, was to launch campaigns of discrimination against socialists, Slavs, and Catholics, to make them into proper Germans. Until they submitted and became imperial Germans, Reichsdeutsche, in his understanding, they would be called Reichsfeinde, enemies of the empire. But third, and most alarmingly from the standpoint of this basic idea of Germany, Bismarck's Reich, for all the violence it unleashed, did not solve the basic problem of making Germany. What is often called Imperial Germany, or Kaiserreich, left out somewhere between one-third and one-fourth of all ethnic Germans, mostly Germans living in Austria and Bohemia. One of these born in 1889, was Adolf Hitler. Now, from all this, I think it's clear that one cannot begin a history of Germany in 1806 with Napoleon. So where does one start? I would say in the beginning was Charlemagne, Karl der Große. His years, to remind you, are 742 to 814. That's when this tradition of the Central European Empire begin, begins. 
It's a fascinating and unlikely story at the beginning. Charlemagne was a Frankish warlord who managed to subdue, in an amazing career of about four decades, lands extending from the Atlantic to Poland. Then, unsatisfied with all that, much of northern Italy. In 800, Christmas Day, he was the first ruler to be crowned emperor for over 300 years in the West. Historians aren't sure why this happened. Charlemagne certainly wanted to control a huge stretch of land, as you could tell, by all this conquest. He did so out of some kind of missionary zeal, for example, converting Saxons, one of his most determined enemies, by the sword, using the sword to make them into Christians. But there is some uncertainty about whether and why he wanted to be emperor. Some historians have said it was because of a conviction, his conviction, that the end of the world was near. What is certain is that the Pope, in crowning Charlemagne Empire, wanted to enhance his power against local rivals in Rome. The Pope made Charlemagne the protector of Christendom so that Charlemagne, the strongest secular ruler of, his, of the time, would protect the Pope from his enemies. But once this happened, an idea came alive, something nobody planned or intended, um, in the west of Europe of a figure who stood above all other kings, the head of an empire higher than all kingdoms, with a transcendent mission supposedly of protecting Christendom. The German idea of Reich, and by the way, one word I didn't talk about is holy, holy Roman Empire, right, has unique religious overtones. It begins, the, I'm sorry, um, the Our, Our Father. Does anybody know how the Our Father begins? Dein Reich komme. Dein Wille geschehe. Um, your, in English, kingdom, in other languages, also kingdom, not in German, empire. Your empire come, is how Germans pray to God. Um, so this, this emperor, after Charlemagne, was not only more powerful, in a sense bigger than anyone else, but also more legitimate, more vested in divine right, this, this, this very vague sense of, of mystical sense of holiness. I'm not going to be able, in the book that I intend to do, to tell the full story of the Reich, which unfolded over many centuries. My aim I'll talk a bit about method now, um, what we call method. My aim, rather, is to move through historical ages and study events where something fateful happened for what would become Germany at a later date, to see what resources accumulated over a lot of time to answer the German question long before anybody could imagine it. In a sense, what I propose, I, in a sense, I propose both seeing each age since that distant past in its own terms without ex post facto judgment, it's not my job to tell you whether the way that Germans understood folk was good or bad. Uh, but I also hope to project history as something that's in motion, becoming attentive to where over centuries history's stream slows or backs up or makes unexpected, and as we can tell only at a very distant retrospect, fateful turns in movement toward our day and what is sometimes called the German problem or the German question. Those fateful turns in the past often involved the sudden appearance of special human beings like Charlemagne, but such people, of course, did not know what legacy they were creating for future generations. So this idea of Reich compelled Charlemagne's successors always to seek power, not just in a vast space in Central Europe, but also as far south in Italy as possible. To live up to its basic meaning, Reich had to have some Italian real estate, precisely because it connected to the legacy of Rome. So the question for a historian of what became Germany is, did this quest to embrace all the Central European lands as well as much more south of the Alps, did this make the early German emperors neglect what otherwise would have become, what became and was a mission of other European sovereigns, namely to consolidate their realms? Unlike the stories we read of England or France or Spain or Denmark, the German story was not just of boundlessness, this constant shape-shifting, but also fragmentation, fragmentation of local nobility within the empire, dukes and barons, princes, becoming independently powerful at the expense of the center of the empire. In a sense, the emperor needed so many soldiers for, so many soldiers for campaigns outside Germany, in Italy but also beyond, that he became faithfully dependent upon local lords in Germany for recruits, for soldiers, and for money. And these lords, over time, drove very hard bar bargains. For example, as an example, in 1232, Emperor Frederick II Hohenstaufen was tending to business outside Germany, also in, 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 in the Holy Land. Um, 
This time, his son Henry, who bore the title of King of Germany, felt compelled to issue a decree. The Latin is Statutum in Favorum Principum, famous decree in German history, which made German princes, very important for everything that comes after, practically sovereign in their lands, much stronger than princes in other European states. Exception, it keeps coming to my mind, the exception is Poland, actually, which we could talk about. Um, so part of the, uh, part of the, of the German Zonderweg, according to historian W.H. Bruford, somebody I read in graduate school, just one among many, wrote as follows, the empire, never a solid structure, was even in the 15th century nothing but a loose league of princes. Its titular head might be endowed in theory with the power of a Roman emperor, but in practice, he had not a foot of land or a single subject. No country was governed in his name or was a source of revenue to him. To him. So the emperor had very little power by the end. Long-term effects of this arrangement, this fragmentation, were ambivalent. Fragmentation, in, in a sense, is actually very positive. It meant that Germany, and you see this to this day, Germany had and has lots of cultural centers. Have you wondered about this? Why are there so many opera houses all over Germany? So many theaters, so many universities, uh, and other kinds of institutions. It has to do with this old heritage of Germany being very divided. Um, this heritage also gives us um, the, the, the origins of Germany's very special and interesting tradition of federalism, which it shares with what other country? The United States of America, right? These are two very unusual federal democracies. So we have actually a lot in common with Germany in that sense. But this tradition also meant that the various princes did not cooperate across Germany, even when they all faced danger, for example, in, in, in the 17th century. Part of that has to do with another source of fragmentation. I'll be coming to the end of my remarks before I say some concluding remarks with this. Another source of German fragmentation, which makes Germany very unusual among European states, and I'm sure you've guessed it already, is religion, the divide between Protestants and Catholics. Um, background of European history is very unusual for a nation state to emerge as divided in this way. Um, <coughs> Netherlands is one case I can think of. Um, so this tradition in turn has to do with a very German event and a very German person who will have a, at least a chapter in my book, but in a sense whose legacy runs throughout it, and that's Martin Luther. Incredibly important. Um, but again, um, the outcome of the work of one person was ambivalent and had little to do with what, with what he intended. Luther helped split Germany more than any other European state by religion, but he also gave it a resource without which there would have been no German national movement centuries later, after 1806. He gave Germany a standard language, the language of his translation of the Bible. Yet his success at one level had little to do with religion or with language. Um, Luther succeeded in making German out of dozens of incompetent comprehensible dialects, which you'll know if you travel through Germany, because of something he had nothing to do with, which was rising print technology and new markets for books and booksellers' desires to make money. So what you may not know is that each new Bible sold contained in it something you have in your hands tonight, a glossary of words that were foreign to the person holding the, the Bible um, from some other part of Germany. So Bavarians could learn from their glossary words that northern Germans used, and north Germans could use Bavarians' words. And over time, each side learned the other's words, making a German language in a sense. There was also something fortuitous about Luther himself, uh, which is he came from the center of Germany, and he could speak to people on all sides uh, of, of, of the dialectical divides, north, south, east, and, and, and west. So ich stehe hier, denn ich kann nicht anders. Uh, well, he stood there, he also stood in the center of the languages, not his intention. So over time, as they read Holy Scripture, Germans from all over Germany also, were, were also taught what became their own language, Catholics included. Um, so this is, strikes me as a very interesting story. Um, so now so some concluding remarks. First remark, if you think, and you may well think this, that I am obsessed with the idea of Reich, Please note the following. On April 1st, 1944, Franklin D. Roosevelt produced a memorandum for the Joint Chiefs of Staff indicating a conviction he had arrived at on German history. And I'll read the memorandum. As long as the word, the word Reich exists in Germany as expressing a nationhood, it will forever be associated with the present form of nationhood. If we admit that, we must seek to eliminate the very word Reich and all that it stands for today, end of quote. So in the, my goal in the book that I hope to write is to look 
at every relevant episode over a very long time that gradually gave that word Reich the meaning that Roosevelt intuited in which a world war uh, destroyed. Since 1945, Germans no longer consider Reich their political home, with some exceptions, as, as Jan has mentioned. Um, second, this German story was a very different kind of story than stories, stories we read elsewhere in Europe, with the possible exception of Russia. Hannah Arendt called the German and Russian states continental empires because they directed their imperial energies toward populations at home and not overseas. But in Germany, there was that additional element in which the empire was also to be the nation state, and not just any nation state, but an ethnic nation state. So what is unusually, I'm sorry, what is usually thought of as a prime characteristic of empire, namely diversity, right? If you think of imperial systems from Rome forward, they usually consist of diverse areas ruled by a center. Um, this empire was to be reduced to homogeneity, the Reich. One method for doing this in Bismarck's Second Reich was forced assimilation, for example, of Poles. Another from the Third Reich, so-called Third Reich, was ethnic cleansing, which crossed a border into genocide. In fact, gave us uh, both of those words. Uh, my third point. This relatively recent history of the last four, five, six generations was not necessary. To say there was a special way, a Zonderweg, a path setting Germany off from other European states, is not to say that the precise way that it twisted up to the present was foreordained, an act of nature, like water forging river, a river through terrain. History was not an act of nature. At each stage, it involved human beings that we can identify. The more I, the author, again, this is a statement about method, the more I, the author, direct attention to twists and turns, not just over decades, but over many centuries, the more I hope to open up the past uh, as a whole in a new way, avoiding what is the chief enemy of history writing, and that is determinism. In a sense, I hope to portray history as it was, as I said, each, each time in terms of itself, but also each time in terms of this uneven and bumpy flow toward the recent pres present, uh, with the huge problem in mind alluded to by President Steinmeier. The centerpiece will be Germany after 1806, a political project that required work by many identifiable human beings several generations of agitation by German publics to create a nation state with a failure in 1848 and then an ostensible success under Bismarck. Bismarck was faced with opportunities not of his making and therefore with choices. So was the very provocative William II who steered Germany to war. Hitler was by no means the fate of German history. The Nazi movement was never chosen by a majority of Germans, even close to a majority. In fact, it was declining with Hitler on the verge of suicide in December 1932, when he was rescued by identifiable conservative politicians. But when he was made chancellor, he made use of twin rhetorical resources better than anyone else in a new kind of party, by the way. The Nazi party was a Volkspartei, unlike other parties at the time. These words were resonant for many Germans, but these words had accumulated over a lot of time um, and impose themselves, in a sense, upon the popular imagination. The older one, of course, is Reich. The more recent one is Volk, which together formed what Roosevelt referred to as the German idea of nationhood. Fourth, if you take a view of Germany over many centuries, you see something that differs from our presentist view, which tends to view Germany as a repeat aggressor, certainly in the, in, in, in the 20th century. What you see is that Germany's view of Germany was very different. Over many centuries into the 20th century, the view was of Germany as a victim, a victim of Fremdherr Fremdenherrschaft, of Fremdbestimmung, plaything of other powers, late comer to nationhood. So, if a historian's prime task is explanation, that is a perspective that needs to be fully recaptured. Fifth and finally, so, the method in the book that I hope to write is unusual for a modern historian. I don't want to prejudice the more recent past, say of March 1933, at the expense of the more distant past, let us say December of the year 800. In both cases, one can wonder how things went as they did, fully aware that they could have gone differently. Charlemagne was not necessary. He was not carved in stone. He was a human like us who needs to be fleshed out, who faced uncertainties, decisions, was reacting to realities also creating them. Why do we modernists have our prejudice in favor of figures of the recent past? 
Konrad Adenauer, Adolf Hitler are just as dead as Charlemagne, Helmut Schmidt or Petra Kelly as dead as Frederick II, Hoven Stauffen. All now is equally powerful or powerless to help shape what came after them, that is our time. It may be that legacies created further back, in fact, are more consequential than le legacies that are relatively recent. Reich was a particularly potent one, in my view. And because of its implication that Germany must control a huge space and make everybody in it ethnically German, regardless of who they were, it was a dangerous one. But I'm going to try to end on a more positive note. The history of Reich was also arguably an inverted history of democracy, only after 1945, when the states of Roosevelt, Stalin, and many others destroyed Reich as a fact, as an idea, as an aspiration. And the Germans' task became governing themselves and not a huge empire. Only then could Germans become what they are today, a nation among nations in Europe, open, as we see, we fellows here at the, at, at, at the, at, at the academy, open, as we see fortuitously in the streets of Berlin, to many others joining. Um, auch solche, die Deutsch mit Akzent sprechen, um, und auch solche, die nicht deutsche Herkunft sind. sind. So people who are supposedly not of a German background and may not even speak German very well at all, uh, there is an openness now to imagining them as Germans. So with that, I conclude, and thank you much for, for your attention. All right, according to um, house rules, I get to ask the first uh, three questions. That's my uh, mm -hmm. privilege, and I intend to, to keep it. Mm -hmm. um, this was very interesting, uh, John. What a, what a tour de force, what a tour d'horizon through uh, German history, the changing meanings of the Reich from uh, Charlemagne to, to Steinmeier. I would certainly never dare to, to do that sort of tour d'horizon. Um, Steinmeier, a president who, who famously uh, refused to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the founding of the Kaiserreich uh, two years ago, which was somewhat controversial uh, among historians that uh, nothing was uh, done about that. Um, because constitutionally, despite all the changes, it's still Bismarck's state uh, that we live in. Right? At least so, so claims our, our um, federal court. Um, I get your argument and I see, you know, that you see something extraordinary in the German vision of the Reich and the way it shaped our, our history, our sense of, of who we are and maybe even more of who we um, intended to be, who we ought to be and what the place in, uh, of Germany and Europe should be. Um, I can follow this argument, but as a historian, it made me think, you know, how are you going to tie it all together to one narrative because it seems like you know, you have 1,000 years, you have these cataclysmic events. So what is, do you have any idea what the book, actually, I guess is my question, could, could look like, and what is the journey that you would take the reader on? Yes, thank you. So uh, I, I guess I would say it's, at one level it's, it's, it's pretty standard uh, histor history writing, uh, so-called Begriffsgeschichte, history of the development of a concept. And it already exists, by the way. There's this great book, Geschichtliche Grundbegriffe, which came out, has come out over time. There's a very long entry by several uh, authors. The most recent is Elisabeth Fehrenbach, which is a wonderful evocation of, of how the, the word Reich actually was understood in its time, all the way back to the time that I'm talking about, to the, to the present, more or less. So what I hope to do is, is, is add to that and talk not just about what the, what the word meant to, um, in general, but what it meant to, to, to Germans all over Germany and how it shaped their political behavior. So I, I, I want to sort of figure out what Reich meant uh, at, uh, over time and how uh, the understanding changed to become more or less inclusive, for example, uh, to involve new other kinds of words. I want to see it in relation to other words, for example, Vaterland. What, what is the history of the relation of Vaterland to Reich? Um, did Prussians consider the, the Vaterland to be Prussia? Um, when did Reich itself, or the idea of Germany, become itself a Vaterland? How did, they, how did that stand in, comp in, in, in maybe in competition with other kinds of ideas? So, um, but as I said, it's, it's, it's a bit it's difficult to say exactly how, how the book would be structured. Obviously, Charlemagne has, has a position, and <laughs> Frederick II, Hohenstaufen, and the, the way that Reich became um, you know, a very unusual kind of empire over time, the instantiation of empire. Uh, Martin Luther is very important. But most of the book will be about after 1806 and how Germans themselves understood Reich. Uh, liberals, for example, or school book writers, or, or German states. They, I, I, one thing I've been able to do here is study the school books that were printed in Germany in the German states in the early 19th century, and I've been able to f figure out how the word Vaterland begins, 
getting transferred to the idea of Germany um, and how a new kind of history comes into focus. These, my obsession, <laughs> one of my obsessions is, is, is with the, the, the 17th century and the destruction of the Pfalz. I didn't get that uh, from a standard history book uh, that we would read. I got it from a history book printed in the 1830s in which the writer was, was suddenly uh, outraged about this having happened centuries earlier. So I want to get, want to get a sense of, of how you know, Reich uh, shaped the ways in which Germany were, Germans were able to think about their political, uh, their political lives. So that's, that's my answer at the moment. Sounds very interesting. Mm. We'd like to stay for a while with the, with the concept uh, of the Reich for another question. And you already mentioned uh, these religious connotations, and they strike me because this is sort of like how the Reich survives into our, our times, I would, I would say, right? Uh, not so much as a, as a constitutional or legal term, but really as a religion, uh, religious terms. You know, Christians are, are uh, promised the Himmelreich, uh, the heavenly kingdom, if we um, stay good Christians. And um, as you mentioned in your talk, you know, they pray in the Lord's Prayer, you know, Dein Reich komme, uh, thy kingdom come. So this is sort of like, um, I think, um, um, underlining the, the point that, um, that, the, that Reich is clearly something much broader and more complex than the meaning of, for example, Regnum in Latin or Empire in, in, uh, in uh, British English, um, which doesn't have these connotations, I, I think. And... Um, um, I ask myself, can we tell the story of the Reich also as a story of the failed secularization of the German state? Or is, you know, this Reich not always something almost metaphysical when, when it is imagined um, by German, well, as East European as we would say, intelligentsia mm -hmm. um, throughout the, the centuries? Or, or, or can we ground it? You know, after all, the story, as you rightly point out, starts with the Holy Roman Empire and it ends infamously with Arthur Muller von den Bruck's combination of the magic number three with the magic uh, term of the Reich. So there we have das, das Dritte Reich. Uh, you know, you, you, you put these, uh, these two things um, um, uh, together, which is quite extraordinary. And then, you know, in my view, does it really end in, in 1945? Because the Reich in West Germany, at least, is replaced with yet another biblical term, the Bund. The covenant between you know um, the, the the Israel and 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 God, you know the, the Bund is another term taken right out of uh, Luther's Bible to now describe the federal uh, republic. So did the secularization fail again, and do we again have a metaphysical term uh, describing the German state, or yeah. you know are these things somehow re relevant to your to your work? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so a few things that occurred to me is that, is that it's an abstraction at some level. It's not a real thing, right? Especially after 1806, it doesn't exist, right? And what interests me in history is always how abstractions cause people to do things that they, they can't justify in reasonable, rational, pragmatic terms, right? So I was a student in East Germany for a number of years and Eastern Europe, and what I noticed in East Germany is that people would use the word der Sozialismus um, to refer to something that actually did, did not have a co concrete... Um, objective uh, status, but was something they imagined to be a utopian form of politics that justified their behavior on an everyday basis. And I got into a terrible argument with an SAD friend of mine once when I claimed that the socialismus didn't exist. Um, and it's similar with Reich. I think that a lot of Germans considered that when Hitler created his Reich, whether they themselves were Nazis or not, they thought that the Reich represented something that had, as you say, a sort of a metaphysical character that they couldn't question and that tended to shape their, 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 their choices in ways that they couldn't really understand or justify. Like, for example, uh, the fact that uh, Germans, generally speaking, uh, unstintingly s supported the German war effort, including the, the, the early acts of aggression against uh, Austria, Bohemia, and then Poland. Um, this could be justified in terms of the Reich. Hitler was, re was recreating the Reich. It's something that even conservative historians and liberal historians thought was a reasonable thing to do, even if they didn't like Hitler. Right? So Reich had this kind of power, as you suggest. Um, but it does extend into the actual phys religious uh, arena by, by the fact of that sig signal in, in, in the Lord's Prayer. Dein Reich kann man dein Wille geschehe wie im Himmel so auf Erden. Uh, so that the Reich was supposed to be realized uh, in heaven just as it was on the earth. So that we could recognize uh, on, on the earth, in the earth, something that had divine appointment, divine will was represented in the Reich on earth. This sounds like a far-fetched idea. It's not a far-fetched idea. It's the way that the mainstream Catholic and Protestant intellectuals thought in the 1920s. And they believe that the Reich, the Reich that I showed you on the postage stamp, 
and the democratic Reich did not live up to the heritage of the Reich, which should be stronger, more somehow, some, somehow um, more mystically endowed, uh, more, more, more unified, right? Um, and so, uh, but in those terms, a democratic Reich was, was thought of as, as a contradiction in terms. Um, but but this, this was something that uh, led to a, a whole sphere. I wrote a chapter about this, actually, in one of my books. Uh, it's a book about uh, the, the shift in thinking about the Jewish people and the Catholic Church. There's a whole early chapter in that book that talks about the seductive um, attraction uh, for Catholic German intellectuals of Nazism, and it lay precisely in this word Reich. I didn't know about the Bund, but obviously Bund is an incredible, is an, at least as important, maybe more important, right? The Alte Bund, the Neue Bund. I don't know about that, but that's obviously something for an epilogue. <laughs> at, at least. <laughs> Well, very well. Yeah, and, and if, if I may add, you know, even, even Heinrich Heine in Deutschland, ein Wintermärchen will das Himmelreich auf Erden schon, schon uh, schaffen. Uh-huh. And, yeah. and he was a very progressive, of course, a German, uh, German right. Jewish uh, thinker and, and poet. Um, so, yeah, it, it even goes beyond these, these narrow traditions of, of Christianity. Well, last question before we open up. Um, again, something that you mentioned in the talk, but I think it's, it's worth, um, you know, uh, looking at a little bit deeper, maybe. You know, there are many other traditions, as you mentioned, of German uh, statehood, you know, other than the Reich. Uh, The many principalities, the free cities, there was Prussia, um, you know, there there was the Kaiserreich, which arguably was just a larger Prussia and not really a Reich, uh, maybe, or some, you know, not imperfect uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Reich or something like that. You know, there's, there's Austria, in German Österreich, Mm -hmm. you know, by the way, even now where it's not really... Reich anymore, um, as my son pointed out to me when we drove into Austria one one day. You know, he said, "Daddy, Österreich is not really a Reich." You know, look at the <laughs> tiny country and what do they call themselves? So you know, I mean, you know, there, there are all sorts of um, uh, things. There's Bavaria. There's there are Switzerland and the Netherlands who, who somehow managed to leave the Reich in 1648 and become very distinct nations. There are all sorts of complicated borderlands from Tyrol to Schleswig, from Alsace to Silesia to East Prussia, and we may ask ourselves, how does the Reich actually matter to people in, in these regions? Um, I mean, if we again look at the, at the 20th century and Bohemia, which I know is one of your favorite subjects, um, supposedly everybody wants Heimann's Reich. Um, I don't know if that was really true, but at least that was the, was the slogan. Um, but still, we, we may ask ourselves, does, don't we like superimpose this modern idea of the Nazis and, and the Alldeutsche of the German Reich on uh, the 19th and the 18th century when maybe in most parts of Germany, you know, the Reich didn't really matter as much as the local identities, the local principalities, the smaller states. Um, you know, doesn't all that German pluralism then get lost behind the facade of that Reich? Or does it not? Well, this is interesting, actually, because I'm just reading from the 1850s and 60s some of the arguments, uh, this is before Bismarck's Reich, um, for uh, recreating a Reich of some kind. And some of the strongest and historically best grounded arguments argue in terms of, partic- of, of, of particularism, of pluralism. Because the old Reich, from a very early point, was not centrally governed. So those who wanted to recreate a Reich were precisely people who were in favor of local identities. And they wanted them maintained. So Reich, in that sense, and also under Bismarck, you know, Reich. Bismarck had the genius uh, of, um, of of creating the, the Reich with very, very strong local government. He knew that he couldn't get uh, the cooperation of Bavaria, for example, without uh, ceding significant um, powers to the to the region. So the Reich, as it existed before 1806, but also after 1871, was a place that actually recognized and made use of local identities. Uh, while at the same time being very clear that there was a larger overarching identity that Vaterland had indeed become the Vaterland of the Germans. That was partly something that had to be educated, had to be uh, taught to people after 1871, but it fell back upon older traditions. You know, the, the, the ethno, I was reading today, that the ethnogenesis of the Germans goes back to the 11th century, the idea of the Germans. I mean, there, there's a, there are Germans, there's a sense of Germans, and there's a sense of other European peoples, but the Germans are one of them going way back and there's a sense of the Germans as being kind of a higher kind of nation. Uh, the word nation itself was, was not very well uh, defined um, until the 19th century. Then, let us say, the Swabians or the Franks or other, other German tribes. Uh, so the, you know, the, 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 the genius of the Reich, um, which lasted quite a while, by the way, I have to give it credit, 
for about a, a thousand years was precisely how it permitted Germans to be themselves in their local <coughs> towns, their Heimat. There's another word that we could, there's very good work on this by Celia Applegate uh, and others who talk about the power of the local in, in, in the German imagination. But it's, it's not against German, right? It's, 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 not, it's not the idea that a Prussian is not a German, but, that a, but, but in a sense the Prussian is a better German by being a good Prussian and vice versa. And the same applies to a Bavarian. The one thing you don't want to do is make a Bavarian into a Prussian. That does not work. <laughs> well, people have That's tried it. and failed, I guess. Oh, and it's interesting that Austria, I'll just say one final thing. Austria, the Österreich, where, by the way, these ideas of particularism are very strong, uh, and the idea that you could actually have people of another nation, other nationalities within the German, the German Empire. It's interesting, after 1945, people in both what we now call Germany and what we call Austria were, were very quickly in agreement that Austria had to go. Austria was still somehow different. There's something called Deutschland that Austria felt was distant from it. So that, in a sense, that's, that's a kind of a, you know, a, kind of a, um, a German land that, 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 that was, considers itself no longer German in the sense that it may have a century ago, let us say. Uh, so that would be part of an answer to your <coughs> very interesting question. Well, thank you very much. Of course, for German ethnogenesis, we could also go back to Tacitus Germania, but we won't do that tonight. Um, it would be another thousand years right there. Preface. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, questions. Uh, Misha David Fox, please. Hi, Michael David Fox. Um, John, what a fabulous lecture. You lived up to both your introductions. Um, and um, I couldn't help thinking to pick up on the second of the third question about religion and particularity. So when you were talking about the distinctiveness of the German usage of Reich, I started thinking about another key word, which was, it seemed, oh, equally distinctive, which is culture, culture, mm -hmm. which was juxtaposed to the universalism of French civilization. Because if you don't have a place, a state, you have to talk about the cultural nation. And then I remembered that Merle Vandenbroek, who Jan mentioned as the originator of the concept of the Third Reich, was also the translator of Dostoevsky and part of the uh, fascination on the German far right in the early 20th century with Dostoevsky, not because of questions of borders and nation and state, but because precisely infused with a messianism and spirituality. So I wonder where this other key begriff comes in to your work. Uh, well, at the moment it doesn't, um, <laughs> because the work uh, is, is in the process of, of becoming, but... Um, I, I've actually been doing it here at the, at the Academy. I've been doing a lot of reading about the emergence of German nationalism um, in the time of what they called Reichspatriotismus, which was patriotism of and for the Reich in the, in the 18th century. And obviously that's the very point at which there emerges sort of a pan-German intellectual elite that feels very clearly that Germany, uh, Deutschland, um, is, is a Vaterland, has mixed feelings about the, the various German entities, and especially the Reich itself because it's, because it's so weak. But the, the absolute center of their devotion is, of course, Kultur, beginning with language. There are language societies that emerge. They begin emerging in the 17th century, but there, there are a whole slew of them emerge all over the map, you know, from, from, from Danzig to, to Hamburg and, 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 and south through um, uh, Hessen and Bavaria. Dozens emerge, uh, language societies devoted to language in the 1730s and 40s. So somehow the, the, this, this, so I'm interested in, the, in, in for the time being in the, in the origin of this fascination with the Kultur, and the way that Kultur itself can, 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 can serve um, as, as, as a kind of a, you know, a mystical uh, quantity that, that justifies political behavior. But I'm not sure how it relates to, to, to Reich uh, as such. I mean, that seems to me that, that the referent there is, is, is more toward, uh, toward Germany and, 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 uh, and in, in, in particular uh, lit, lit, literature as opposed to, uh, German literature as opposed to French literature, right? Because the French tradition in the 18th century was more classicist and the Germans had to define themselves as being something else against that tradition in the 18th century. So I haven't, haven't really moved into the period of, uh, that you refer to, the late 19th century, but um, certainly something to have in mind. Um, the interrelation for me is not so much Kultur, but not Nation und Volk. Right? How, how, are the, how do those relate to, to, to Reich? Um, but, um, yeah, I, I'll keep that in mind. One thing I, 
I do kind of because I have this big big chunk of time I want to work on. I can't do everything, right? So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna really try try to keep keep, keep a sense of, of Reich at the center of it and see where that leads. Um. Well, thank you. Since this is a hybrid uh, event, I'm going to read one question from the um, from the chat. Actually, this is um, Mitchell Ash from Vienna. Oh, hello, uh, writing Mitchell. and saying hello to you, John. Um, I quote, surely it means, must mean something for your story that the Kaiser of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation for most of its history was the king of Austria and that a fundamental precondition for the creation of the German nation state was the violent exclusion of German Austria. And yet you mention Austria in your talk only in the passing. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So what do these facts mean to your story? That's... That's well, I'll question. tell you, and my wife Fiona knows this, I was just in Leiden, Netherlands last week, I gave a whole talk on Austria, and its tradition of Reich, is, it, it's, it's def, Mitchell, it's def, don't, uh, you're, exactly, you're, you're precisely right, There's, there, there is a concern in Austria about what to do with the word um, empire after 1806, because the Austrians then, the, the Habsburgs actually lose a claim to the imperial glory that they had previously, and their response was to create a new empire which they called Kaisertum, Kaisertum Österreich, which emerges in 1804. Uh, but they're very, very hesitant to use the, use the word Reich uh, throughout the early, Metternich in particular. This is what one, one of the findings from reading, I've been reading Metternich uh, a lot as well in regard to Austria. Metternich was very worried that if Austria were to call itself a Reich after 1806, that it would be thought of as, as having the burden of uniting Germany. And Metternich was, as you, as you know, a great skeptic of German nationalism because he knew that German nationalism meant some kind of popular sovereignty, right? national self-determination. But Austria then, after, in 1848 and 49, did gradually begin, begin using the word and adapting it. And so after, 18, uh, six, after 1871, there are actually, for the first time and only time in history, Mitchell, there are two emperors, one in Berlin and one in, um, in, in Vienna. Uh, but it's a very it's, it, it's, it's a very fraught kind of relation. It's, it's clear that they're both claiming this legacy, this earlier legacy. Um, and the way that it's resolved, in a way, is World War I, is that the two, Austria comes really under the tutelage of Germany, and the two conspire in trying to recreate uh, Mitteleuropa, which is itself a kind, kind of a, a reinstantiation of the Old Reich, which, is, which, which has the, the, the mission of controlling a huge space. Uh, a ger it would have been a German-Austrian-dominated space. Um, but Mitchell, I, I, I can send you that, that, that paper is actually coming out in the Austrian History, History Yearbook. It's a big story and an important one, you're absolutely right, but I didn't, I didn't say anything about it tonight, or very little. Okay, next question for the room, um, Thomas Lindenberger. Thank you very much, John, for this fascinating speak, speech. I, I would like to uh, turn a little bit to the earlier period. You also cover the period of early modern history. And I would like to ask you, how can you place your story of the Reich and the Reich idea in the German lands within the story of European expansion? because there might be a geographic, geo geopolitical or geocultural dimension to it, making the German lands different from the, so to speak, big competitors, which created other empires on their own, which had this specific feature of being overseas empires and of consolidating over this feature of European expansion, which the German lands did not achieve. Uh, in a way, it reminds me also what Jan was alluding to, the, the Heine poem, where he speaks about the Reich the Germans are creating within their culture, instead of uh, being able to do it politically. And the uh, kind of connotation with this is that was their way Anyway, since centuries already, that's how uh, Heine relates to it. And that would uh, also, I think, uh, tie up or be related, can be related to what you mentioned, the expansion of the German language with uh, the pr inventing of the printing press, etc., etc., as the way to do Reich, whereas other ones would... Uh, extrovert or kind of export their Reich ambitions. Shouldn't that be a part of yes. the narrative? 
Yes, I have to confess though, I don't know what Germans were thinking about the um, overseas expansion in the, the, the period of the first imperialism, right? So this is, this is uh, 17th, 18th centuries, the first imperialism. I don't know what Germans were thinking about uh, the fact that they were left out of that entirely because there was, the, the, their Reich, of course, was not involved in that. We do know in the, uh, in, in the 19th century, as soon as Germans could be, be, became able to talk about their ambition for a Reich, they very quickly began thinking in, in, in what they called in terms of Weltpolitik, right? It, it's interesting that the, the word, you know, Reichspolitik was, 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 was always considered to be something different from Weltpolitik. Um, Bismarck, so we're jumping way ahead into the 1870s. Bismarck, as you know, I don't know if, whether the audience generally knows this, was um, very hesitant uh, to, to embrace imperialism in the sense that you've mentioned, in the sense of creating overseas empires. Uh, but, but he gave in. And especially as you know, his, his successors gave in. Um, and the way that I understand it is, is that there, w there was a sense in the German population that you know, among Germany's the ways in which Germany had, had been mistreated by history was being left out of this imperial race. So there seems to have been within German society, extending into the working class, uh, a, a consensus that Germany needed to be involved in Weltpolitik. And so there is this grab for colonies coming a bit late, but still leading to very significant <coughs> German colonial uh, enterprises in Africa and elsewhere by the 1890s and the like. But Bis you know the famous story about Bismarck when he was people were enthusiastic in the 1870s about imperialism. He said he called his you know the stories he called his advisors over to, to say this is my map of Africa. Here is Russia to our east, and here is France to our west, and we are in the center. That is my map of Africa. In other words, that was, that was, that was the way that he was going, going, going to involve himself in imperial politics. But his successors were unable to resist the, the allures of empire, and as I, as I understand, in, in, in that sense, right? I actually had a very long argument with a very gifted historian, I forget uh, his name, in, in Jena last year, who insisted for a very long time that you could not possibly apply the word empire to Reich the way that it traditionally existed, right, in the time that you're talking about. Because the, 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 the international understanding of this word is so different from that local understanding. Uh, but nevertheless, the, there were overlaps, um, and there are ways in which the various states that made Reich, right, so Bismarck's Reich, Hitler's Reich, uh, tried, to do, tried to do things that they saw other empires doing. But, but um, I think the, the main focus, as you know, of, uh, of, of the Third Reich was, of course, the land empire. That was, that was the ultimate... With, without abandoning the sea empire, but Hitler was, would have been willing, you know, if Britain had been uh, unwise enough to, to, to strike a deal with Hitler, there would have been some openness in his mind to exchanging overseas for um, colonies for control of land. Okay, we sort of have to wrap it up soon. I'm going to read one more question from the chat, to be fair. And then we had two people here in the, in the front, and then you choose to decide whatever you uh, like to answer from these. Um, there's <coughs> Jeffrey Feldman writing in the chat. Uh, John, this is super enlightening. Thank you. Wish I was there. How about Swiss Germans today? Are they viewed by Germans in Germany as having a status equivalent to those you described um, for the Austrians? And... If so, when did the other Germans start to be seen as something different? Uh, then I have the gentleman over there and another in the back. So shall I deal with that question first? Or we oh, no, we'll just collect them and then okay. you do, you know, because we're a little bit running out of time. Okay. It's just one um, uh, short question. Will the law feature in your um, uh, deliberations uh, at all? I remember um, uh, there was at once a, a small booklet, uh, Ein Reich, Ein Recht, which was mm -hmm. uh, which dates from sort of the late 1800s uh, in the uh, in the context of uh, the development of the Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch, um, which uh, probably was the first time that there was one body of law applicable in in in, in the entire German lands, if you will. Yes. Um, but only then, uh, uh, and until then, uh, uh, there were so many different laws in Germany that yes. uh, you couldn't really talk about that. So uh, I wonder whether you uh, yeah, will take that into your consideration as well. Thank you. Okay, final question. Yes, uh, thanks for this very thought-provoking uh, uh, talk, uh, John. Um, what strikes me is that when we Germans uh, um, talk today, we use the term Reich almost on a daily basis. And that is whenever we refer uh, to a country that has a monarchy, 
tomorrow the king of the Königreich Großbritannien is visiting Berlin. Uh, uh, there are many kingdoms, Königreich to be uh, uh, translated, uh, still existing all around the world. And so I wonder, um, is this term Reich not very closely, almost exclusively related to monarchies? Uh, or are there, for example, uh, also examples where a republic tried to expand uh, its territory in terms of a Reich? Thank you. Well, I'll deal with the last question first. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a provocative question. I, I would almost go so far as to say that no republic can ever have the word Reich in its title, in whatever in whatever language, whether it's Norwegian or Dutch. I was just, you know, as I mentioned in the Netherlands last week, and they use Reich, of course, to refer to um, kingdom, uh, not not empire in that in that sense. And the same is true, as I understand it, in Norway and other other places in Sc Scandinavia. But these are constitutional monarchies. I believe once you go into the into the realm of a, of a republic, you then leave behind, like France. There's no no room for their equivalent of the word Reich. Uh, but it's but it's important. It will be important for me actually to capture the distinction between you know, Königreich and Reich. Um, and by the way, this is something that I've also written a bit about. Uh, the German word Reich actually goes back to a Celtic word. Uh, you may not have expected that. But it goes back to um, a Celtic word that simply mean, meant uh, realm or rule. And so the word Heinrich means ruler of the home. Did you know that? Um, anyway, so um, so there is that. And, and, and Germans would refer to, in my period, Ungarisches Reich, Polnisches Reich, meaning, but not using the word that the Poles or the Hungarians would use necessarily, but simply their projection of the idea of power onto those entities. Um, it was, you know, more Königreich Ungarn, I think one would say. And Poland considered itself to be a commonwealth. But yeah, I, I'm actually, as you could probably tell, I'm fascinated by these questions, but that would be my, my answer for the time. But that would be something for, for, to pursue, whether a republic can actually be, have that, any kind of right. I don't believe it can. Law, absolutely crucial. Um, the structure uh, which structured, uh, which made the, um, uh, the Holy Roman Empire in its, in its time uh, was precisely legal arrangements that people valued, respected, and when they were gone, they missed them. Um, and there, there is actually very good literature, secondary, it's called Verfassungsgeschichte, the original origins of German Verfassungsgeschichte, constitutional law, precisely in studies of the old empire, um, which, you know, you have to actually tip your hat to, because it, it was summarized by J.J. J. Um, Moser, the, the expert of the 18th century, I think in 30 volumes. Nobody, and that's why nothing ever got done, because there was so much law that people could, could never reach a, a, a conclusion of it. But yes, it needs to be dealt with, and I, I respect that. I mean, uh, this, uh, the idea of Rechtsstaat obviously is a German, a German idea, right, or a German word at least, um, and that has some some relation to the Old Reich. So definitely be paying attention to that. And then Jeff's question about Swiss and Austrians. Well, the Swiss, yeah, the Swiss left. Uh, the empire uh, in, in the early modern period, the Austrians more, 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 more recently. Um, I, I, think, um, I think now, as you know, ger 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 there's, there's a certain comfort that I think people in Germany have with imagining Austrians as being part of another nation, but part of the same cultural realm, certainly Swiss. Right. I mean, we've we've been reading a lot of uh, Max Frisch here. You know, watching films based on the work of Max Frisch here, Friedrich Dürrenmatt and the like. There's there's no. This is a again. It's it, it's a very old cultural unity, and I think the Swiss and, and and the Austrian areas are part of that. Without these areas being consider, considered to be threatened, and it's it's also true. I I learned uh, in my readings here at the academy that when Germans, this is a little known fact, I think that when Germans in the 18th century uh, were learning their their sense of patriotism. Who did they learn it from? The Swiss. The Swiss were writing a sort of cutting-edge work about, about the idea of patriotism in, in the mid-18th century. And it was Germans, because it was the same language from the Holy Roman, the, the Holy Roman Empire, who were reading this stuff and finding it fascinating. So I, um, so I think that in, in the case of this, but um, I'm not going to stop. I'm not, I, was, I was thinking I would, I would tell you something from, from, the, from the time of the Third Reich, but I won't go there. Because I don't, I don't want to end on on, on a sour note about about that. But uh, but these these are issues that, that, that continue to be to to be um, 
discussed. Um, fortunately, I think that culture over time, to get back to Michael David Fox's concern with culture, has, has imposed itself upon politics, and currently people are happy thinking about there being a German cultural realm without imagining that it needs to be a single political realm, let alone an empire. So that would be my concluding remark. Well, thank you very much.